Okay, so we got the kids up here for a reason. I'm going to say a few things about baptism this morning. And then we have, we have one testimony that I actually want the kids, I want you guys to be here to see. Um, as one who's a few years older than you is making the choice to get baptized this morning. And so I want you guys to hear his testimony as he comes forth. So uh, no extra pressure there on young Noah. What a blessing, baptism, uh, to witness people saying, hey, I want to plant my flag. I want to declare my devotion to Jesus, my King, my God, my Savior. What an opportunity for us. What a treasure for us as a church to be able to come around them and just celebrate God saves sinners. Early Christians referred to baptism by a Latin word, sacramentum. It's a word that means, it's a word that would have been used of a Roman soldier giving his absolute devotion and obedience to his commanding general. That's what the early church thought of baptism. It wasn't something to be done flippantly. It was something of great seriousness. In Romans chapter 6, Trevor read this morning, I'll just read the first eight verses again. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may increase? By no means. We have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we know certainly also we will be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. I I love that passage when it comes to thinking about baptism. This is really a, a testimony to Jesus Christ. It's it's the old man, the old the old us enters the water of Jesus Christ. The living water. And our sins are placed on Christ on the cross. And and in Him, our old self dies. But just as He rose from the grave, we too are in Him resurrected to new life. A new person in Jesus Christ. Forever forgiven, cleansed, alive. A dead man enters the water. A live man comes forth. And and here in Romans chapter 6, there actually is no water. This This is a figurative picture of what happens in our union with Jesus Christ. But the water baptism that we practice this morning is a representation, it's a a symbolization of a reality that's already taken place in the one who is coming forward to be baptized. The water represents Christ. It represents our entering into Him 
Him that cleanses us. Him that makes us alive. Him that brings us a, 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 a new man. Forgiven. Baptism really gives the world such a beautiful visual picture of what Jesus Christ has already done in our lives as believers. Dead and buried with Him. Washed clean in Him. Raised to new life through Him. It's not the water. It's Him. And in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew's great commission passage The Lord Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said this, All authority, I want you to think about those words, all authority, all of it, all authority that exists, Jesus says, in heaven and on earth, has been given to me, he said. Past tense. All authority, Jesus says, is mine. As a result of that, therefore, go, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so according to that passage, we could, we could actually make this statement of baptism for the church, for, for the disciple of Jesus Christ, for the believer, for the new man. Baptism is the first, it is the initial step of discipleship. Now, I say that and I I clarify that because, because I think, frankly, in the church today, often we get this a little mixed mixed up. We we tell people, well, boy, I'm just not sure if you're ready to get baptized. I, I I haven't really seen enough fruit in your life. Maybe we should give it some time. Well, wait a minute. It's the first step. It's the initial step when a person believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we certainly have something that the early church, uh, we we miss something that the early church had. In the early church, in those days, for example, in Acts chapter 2, as as some thousands came to Christ, 3,000 people came to Christ and were baptized, they had something in, in their lives that we don't have. Baptism for them was a planting of the flag in the midst of a hostile culture. Baptism for them, for one to submit their lives to baptism, for them, well, that jeopardized everything. They could lose their jobs, they could lose their homes, they could lose everything. They could lose their lives by submitting themselves to baptism because baptism was a proclamation of, I believe in Jesus Christ. My life is so tied together with Him that as He died, I died. As He rose, I rose. I believe in Jesus Christ. Here I stand. God help me. And and they could die for that. And so you could be pretty sure that those who were getting baptized, they were kind of serious about it. Well, for us today, often we, we maybe don't approach baptism with quite the seriousness that they did. But baptism is an initial step. It's a, it's a beginning step. It's the first step in the life of a believer in Jesus Christ. It is an indication of our union 
with Christ. We are going to enter the water today. Five individuals. There, there are two others that, that wanted to be baptized today, but their work schedules don't allow them to be here today. And, and, and they'll be baptized on another day coming up. But we've got five individuals today that are getting baptized. And none of them, none of them are going to be saved because they get in this water. Not one of them. Not one of them are going to have their sins washed away because we get in this water. Not one of them. In fact, the only reason they get in the water, the only reason they come to be baptized today, is because of the reality that that has already taken place in their lives. They have already been joined to Christ. They have already been made new. They have already been forgiven of their sins and completely cleansed by faith in Jesus Christ and by nothing else. And they come today to be obedient to our Christ. You see, Jesus often qualified true love for him we find this in Luke 6, in John 14, John 15, John 16, 1 John chapter, chapter 5. We find this all over the place, that true love of Jesus Christ is a love that obeys Jesus Christ. And so these come today to say, Christ, my God, my King, my Savior, my Redeemer, I want to be obedient to you. And so that's what we as a church get to witness today. What a beautiful thing for us to witness. So let me call forward today our first testimony to be given. Noah, would you come and, and share your testimony with us? My name is Noah Rochelle. I'm 10 years old. I live in a Christian home. But that does not make me a Christian. This is my testimony of being saved. Before I came to Jesus, I did not care about God's word. I lied a lot and did not care if I lied. I said bad words a lot to my brothers and I did not care if I said bad words to anyone except for my parents because they were dead mad. I thought I was better than the people who are sinners and I thought I was the best always when I liked some when I liked something I would write it everywhere I, and my dad said that could be a sin of idolatry. I also often was negative about things and had a fear of talking. I believed I got saved when Pastor Mike came to preach on John 3. I learned I need learned that I need to repent and believe by looking to Jesus. So that's what I that, so that's what I did. That's when God changed my heart and cleaned my soul. God changed me that I did not want to sin. I want to fight against my sin and give it to Jesus. My dad told me that Jesus gives his his righteousness and Jesus takes my sin. Praise God and thank you Jesus for dying on the cross. I wanted to be baptized right away because I want to show Jesus that I love him by obeying his word. Since being saved, I have been able to overcome my fear talking in school to my teachers. Praise God. A Bible message that means a lot to me. Me is John three fourteen to 16. And Moses lift up, up the serpent in the wilderness so 
must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his, his own son that whoever believes in him shall should not perish but have eternal life. I want to encourage it, encourage to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. Look to Jesus to be saved and show Jesus you love him by being baptized. So we're going to we're going to go ahead and and release the kids at this time, but I I wanted you guys to be able to hear someone who's not a whole lot older than you giving their testimony of Jesus Christ and his his grace in his life and you know in the years to come for you guys as you place your faith in Jesus Christ this is something for you to think about as well baptism is a hugely important step we're not saved by it but we get baptized because we are saved and if we are saved we should desire to be obedient to the Lord let's pray as we send the kids downstairs father um, I, I, I pray for these little ones as they go down, as they're instructed, Father, as, as your word is open to them. Father, I pray that you would open their hearts, that they would respond to the gospel of your son. Uh, Father, that they would hear the good news, that they would rejoice in the good news as they put their trust in Jesus Christ. And Father, we look forward in the years to come to many baptisms as, as these trust in you. Father, we pray that you would instruct them and we pray this for the glory of your name, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. My name is Susan. I started coming to Fellowship Baptist Church from September 2018. I wasn't born in a Christian family. In fact, I didn't know any Christians around me before coming to Canada. Before knowing Christ, I didn't know the purpose of life. Even though I didn't know God, I knew there were a higher being that controls everything. Back then, I would go to the Buddhist temple with my grandma and then asking for good grades at school because that was an important thing for me. And I didn't know that uh, worshiping other gods were a sin. I would also have like a Buddhist statue in my, in my house and I would worship that statue before going to a test. Uh, in, in 2018, I moved to Canada uh, 2013, sorry. I moved to Canada and started high school. First, my parents and I, we arrived in a city in Ontario, and we began to go to church because we were told that people there are nice and then it was a good place to practice English. In grade 10, my mom and I moved to Saskatoon. Shortly after moving here, a lady who came from the same province as me invited both of us to her house where somehow a conversation about human existence began. As I was taught before, humans came from monkeys, but she said that if, there, if that was true, then why monkeys still exist? And that really triggered me to question and then start believing the existence of God and how he has created the heavens and the earth and humans. Later that day, this lady took us to a superstore for shopping where my mom and I met Chao Chin, and she told us about the gospel and gave us a few websites where we could watch sermons. Later, both, of, both my mom and I believed in God and started praying. But those prayers were self-centered and just asking God to solve our problems. 
In the second semester of grade 10, I got a very low grade in an assignment and then began to question the purpose of studying, which I have questioned for a long time since studying has been the major part of my life. God gave me 1 Corinthians 10, 30, 31. It says, so whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Then I started to know that all we do is for God and to glorify him, not not for ourselves. So both my mom and I got baptized in January 10, 2016, but it was only um, washing of the forehead. And uh, recently after listening to pastor's sermon, I decided to get a submerged baptism as it represents um, dying with Christ and rising with him again. And also for my previous baptism, I wasn't able, I didn't get a chance to share my testimony publicly. So this is a great chance for me to share what God has done in my life and to glorify him. It wasn't hard for me to accept that I was a sinner uh, when I was told so. I knew that I had done many wrong things in the past, but it was only um, in my head. Throughout the years after, little by little, God has revealed to me how sinful I am. I would say with my mouth to seek his will and put him first, but instead I just seek what I want. Um, Romans 7.15 really summarizes this, for I do not do what I want, but I do everything for the very thing I hate. Every time I look at myself, I'm just depressed and hopeless. And looking around the world, the world, there is no hope either. And I know that the hope is only in the Lord. I'm just so thankful for what he has done on the cross and paid my debt and how he has changed my heart to a new heart. I'm, now I'm still struggling with many different things and still have moments that um, I know the teachings in my head, but it just did not arrive in my heart and I did not do in practice. And I know that I cannot do any of these by myself and I know that my only hope is in him and believe what he has done. Philippians 1.6 just really encouraged me as he said, he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I'm just so thankful and very thankful that um, I can follow Jesus for the rest of my life. Thank you. Yudoka and Vanessa, would you come? I, I want you to notice in the testimonies that we've heard even so far, in both of the testimonies that have been offered, I, I want you to notice that someone shared the gospel. Salvation wasn't possible without someone sharing that gospel message. And this should encourage us as, as Christians you know, not everybody that we share the gospel with comes to faith in Christ. But we know this, none will ever come to faith in Christ unless the gospel is shared. So it encourages us. God saves people and he saves people through his gospel. Let's share that gospel message. I always saw myself as a good church girl. I was born into the typical Christian family. Compulsory morning devotion, whether you like it or not. Mandatory attendance to church every Sunday with failure to do so attracting punishment. I was taught that sins like lying, stealing, etc. were bad and would cause you to go to hell. And this could only be avoided when you surrender willingly and give your life to Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior. I remember this ritual I observed where after every Sunday school, I would give my life to Christ, then proceed to live a holy life as much as I could, reading my Bible and praying daily, singing Christian songs, keeping to myself and not talking to anyone because I knew it would lead me on the pathway to sin. This would go on Monday, Tuesday, but by Wednesday I would get tired of the boring and rigid living and fall back to my carefree sinful ways only to start the cycle by Sunday. I hardly disobeyed my parents. I didn't keep bad company. I never stayed out late and always came straight home after any activity. 
I got excellent grades and was often presented as the model child by my parents to my younger brother. I was very active in my Sunday school, belonged to almost every department. Yes, I thought I was a good church girl. During my second year in college, I gave my life to Christ yet again. But this time I told myself it would be the last time because I was now ready to live my life for Christ. I joined one of the reigning prosperity churches then that was, always, that, that was also geared primarily towards youths. I joined the school chapter and became committed. It was there I met my husband who was also serving in church but in another chapter. Despite being a dedicated worker in church and a professing Christian, I still went about my evil ways. Like I would tell a friend, I never mixed church business with pleasure. So I always went where I wasn't known and indulged myself fully in sin. This former church of mine taught me lots of doctrines, which looking back now, I know are all false. When my dad had a stroke, became paralyzed and bedridden, I applied everything I was taught so that I could possess my dad's healing. I was on fire for the Lord, as they said, because I had been told that was the due I had to pay in exchange for his divine healing. Despite everything, my dad passed on. Following that, I left my church. A few years later, I reconnected with my husband, too, after which we got married. Early 2018, my husband got saved, after which he started sharing the gospel with me through books, articles, and scriptures. They didn't make sense to me. When he discussed them with me, I couldn't make head or tails of it. I told myself that as a good wife, I had to submit to his spiritual authority and play along for the sake of peace. So I went through the motions, day in, day out. At the beginning of 2019, he bought the documentary, American Gospel, for us to watch. God used that documentary as a tool, and for the first time, I truly heard the truth of the gospel. I was dead in trespasses and sins in which I once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom I once lived in the passions of my flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and was by nature a child of wrath like the rest of mankind. I was a terrible wife, mother, daughter, friend, a sinner through and through. Romans 1.18 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by the unrighteousness suppress the truth. This was what I deserved, God's judgment and wrath. I deserved nothing less than death. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved me, even when I was dead in, tre in my trespasses, made me alive together with Christ. In no way did I deserve his mercy and grace. Yet God in his divine will drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, setting my steps secure. That the sovereign almighty God would look at a wretched, undeserving human like me and call me to him to be part of his elect, despite how terribly undeserving I was. He saw me with no atom of good in me and saved me from eternal condemnation. He removed my heart of stone and gave me a heart of flesh, a new heart, and placed a new spirit within me. He predestined me for adoption to himself as a son through, his, through Jesus Christ in accordance to the purpose of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace. He gave me the gift of faith to believe in his son Jesus Christ, declared me justified and imputed in me the righteousness of Christ through his death on the cross, and taking the punishment and I deserved. I am no longer in danger of his wrath. For Christ saved me from God's wrath, breaking down the wall of hostility, drawing me near through his blood, reconciling me to God, and making me a fellow heir and partaker of his promise. By his grace, I am saved through faith. I am at peace with him and no longer condemned. The law of sin and death has no power over me because I have been set free in Christ by the law of the spirit of life. In Christ, I am a new creation. The old me has passed away, and behold, the new me has come. 
Daily, I am, I am a witness to the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in my life. The false doc doctrines I believed, I now see the truth of God's word. I struggle with the concept of God's sovereignty. Yes, I believed God was sovereign. However, he could intervene in the world's affair only when I prayed. I believed I was a small God who could create things with my words. I believed I was the ruler and owner of my destiny and decided how it went. So only when I gave God the control would he be able to transform my life for good. How utterly foolish of me. God is sovereign over everything. He is the beginning and the end, omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. He rules over all, and whatever he wills will come to pass. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. We are always subject to God's absolute sovereignty. God will ultimately accomplish his sovereign purposes. Job 42, 2 to 6 took the words right out of my mouth. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, have I uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here and I will speak. I will question you and you make it known to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. I used to believe that I had this special purpose for which I was created, which, if left unfulfilled, would be the damnation of my soul and life. How typical of a sinner like, of a sinner like me to think so highly of myself. God's truth is ever clear, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I am called on to good works to give and bring glory to his name. There is no greater calling than this. I am doing, in my current phase, I am doing good works by submitting to my husband. I am doing good works by keeping our home. I am doing good works by raising godly children. I am doing good works by being part of the body of Christ and serving there. God has been and is so faithful in my life. I am thankful to him for those he has placed in my life that are helping me in this journey. My husband, through his diligent leadership and guidance, my sisters in the faith, both near and far, and for this church where the unadulterated truth of the word is taught judiciously. Praise be to him alone. the church. It's always an honor to stand before the church to testify of God's grace and his mercies in delivering me from his wrath and revealing his gospel to me. I was born into a Christian home and I thought that I was saved by my devotion to doing the requirements demanded by the law, such as obeying my parents, going to church nominally, participating in the sacraments, and giving up things that I have to give up just to serve God. I got deeply involved in the Word of Faith movement. Like my wife had already explained, I dived into so many mystical practices that were practiced in this church. And the movements, such like glossolalia, naming it and claiming it, seeing visions, speaking words of wisdom, speaking words of knowledge, self-worship, deification of man, and idolatry in all forms, as is rife in all the charis on what is, is prevalent in the charismatic movement of our present day. I thought I had the gospel because I participated in evangelistic practices. I went around preaching once in a while. I did good works as seemingly uh, judged by man's standards. I was telling people to produce good fruits to repent but my understanding of the gospel didn't go beyond the idea that Christ came to die for me, to save me from sin, to save me from poverty, to save me from suffering, to save me from hell, to save me from sickness, and to translate me into a place of dominion, the place that Adam fell from when he sinned. My gospel was a gospel suiting to the ears in a world that is fraught with evil, terrorism, and calamity. In my own eyes, I was basically good. 
because I had heaped up a lot of treasures of merit in heaven by my good works, my devotion, my pietism, and in my eyes I was holier than others because I didn't commit sins as grievous as they did. In my eyes I was righteous because I did good and others affirmed that I was good. My understanding of doctrine was only founded on what we call moralism, humanism, and basic social psychology. On things that had no basis in the Bible and things that were only extra biblically revealed from men that we venerated to be speakers and prophets of God who colored the words of God with soothing words that appear like light. When I would hear of the wrath of God back in those days, I would cringe in anger and retort back to those people saying they don't know who God is because God is love and he has no wrath. In fact, I would challenge them by saying God has little sovereignty when it comes to his dealings with man because he had given us dominion and that we are little gods with a small g. I only came to realize that I created a God in my own liking, and I was guilty of suppressing the truth of God in unrighteousness so that I could relish in my sins. Who wretched sin I was, and if not for God's mercies, I will remain lost till today. I cannot practically state when and where and how I got saved, or my conversion experience, but I could trace it to a process that started after I lost my dad, who was misdiagnosed um, to a heart attack four years back. I began questioning things about my beliefs. I began asking myself if God is really powerful, if the words that I say actually can bring things to life, calling things into existence as though they were not. I began asking God questions and challenging him for not being faithful because I had kept my own part so I was entitled and I felt God never existed or God just decided not to answer my prayers. In my anger towards God and my state of devastation after losing my dad and having so many other challenges going on at the same time, I reached out to a friend who was also a member of my former church. And uh, she began to share with me some truths as she also had gotten saved and sharing scriptures, sharing videos, sharing teachings, teachings from sound men of God's word. I would watch a few sometimes. I would not watch some when I feel I, I, I don't understand what these people are saying. But on, on the 24th of April, 2018, I was watching a clip by Todd Freer where he quoted a passage from the scripture in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. In that passage, he says, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and, ab and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, but who by no mean will, means will clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and children's children to the third generation. After hearing this, I paused for a moment to try and understand the paradox. How will a God who is merciful, how will a God who is gracious, how will a God who is slow to anger and abounding in love not clear the guilty bothered me so much? And in my anger, to want to pursue a contradictory statement to that, I found that this statement was replete all over scripture. Yes, God is love, God is merciful, God is gracious, but above all, God is holy and God is just. And because of these attributes, he cannot experience sin, he cannot behold sin, therefore he must punish the sinner it was only then I understood that I was included in the pack of sinners that deserve God's righteous and holy wrath. For no one is righteous, no one seeks God, no not one. For we have all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. All we like sheep, each has strained to his own way. I, all I deserved was God's justice. It was only then I understood the gospel. 
that God in his mercies paid for my punishment by sending his son to die for me. All I needed to do was to receive this gift of salvation by faith, believing in the finished work of God his son. Yes, I was a vessel of wrath prepared for destruction. I was a wretched sinner deserving of God's justice, but in God's divine sovereignty, chose to save me to his eternal glory with him. I'm not saved from sickness, now I know. I'm not saved from poverty. I'm not saved to live my best life now. I'm not saved to do whatever I deserve, but I'm saved to a hope and a calling to live a life that is pleasing to him and to glorify him alone. Therefore, the good works I do do not merit me anything more than the works Christ did for me when he paid his ransom for my sins on the cross. Ever since coming to this understanding, I can testify that I've seen the works of God revealed in so many ways in my daily activities. I've come to an understanding of the gospel and I've, I've come to a point where I can overcome the desires that I couldn't overcome in the past, sins of lust, sins of the flesh, sins of pornography, sins of lying, sins of stealing, sins of adultery. God has helped me overcome these. I see now through the regenerative work of God as evidence in the life that I now live, a strong desire and a genuine hunger for God's word to, to know him more deeply every day and not just as a perfunctory exercise. By God's grace, I notice that I don't have the desires of the flesh to sin like I used to in the past. Although the temptations come, I prefer, to, I choose to please God and, and to shun the pleasures of sin. My orientation towards life is different so much that even in trials and uncomfortable situations, I notice a sense of peace and a sense of deeper trust in God who is sovereign above all and actively involved in every situation that I go in or I go through and is not taken by surprise that I'm going through them because he ordained them to use them to glorify his name in the end. Brethren, the gospel has given me a true perspective to life, a true perspective to purpose, a true perspective to trials, being a better husband, and to be a better parent and a Christian. I rejoice in this with profound gratitude to God who has made in his perfect will, not that I, not only in my life, but also in the life of my wife, who is standing by my side to testify. I'm grateful to God because of his marvelous works in my life and in my family. I don't deserve this. I know that the work he has started, he will finish in eternity. Praise God. We, we hear these testimonies as Christians and the, these truths that we're so familiar with. And, and uh, I, I think as we, as we look back on these, you know, for, for us who have been walking with Christ for years, I think it's just so good, you know, to, to think back on what did it look like when I first came to Christ? How, how, how did I love him so and, and to just, you know, think about, have I left my first love a little bit, maybe? You know, do I, do I love him today? Is he, is he so real to me today like he was then? He was so real, you know? Uh, we, we hear of these, these testimonies, and, and people are, you know, just, man, God, thank you, thank you. Like, you would save me? Me, thank you. It's just such a blessing to hear testimonies, isn't it? Kevin, come share with us.
Good morning. Um, I don't know if it's just me, but it seems a little more emotional in here today than normal. I um, have to admit I was nearly in tears uh, while we were singing today, so hopefully I make it through this without, without too many. Uh, my name is Kevin Stewart. Um, we've been attending church here for nearly seven months now, um, so I'm just going to stick to script from here, so I may not make too much eye contact. This morning, I have the privilege to take part in a long-standing Christian tradition, an outward, visible proclamation of an inward transformation, uh, to identify with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection into new life, baptism. This is a ceremony as Christians that we are instructed to do, an act of obedience after being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is my desire as a Christian to be obedient to what the Bible says. I want to grow in sanctification, to be a follower of Christ who properly fears the one true and living God who has the power to destroy both soul and body rather than fear man who can only kill the body. To be a light in a world that already stands condemned before an infinitely holy God living out its natural course towards destruction. This was the very same course that I was on, an individual, personal path that I am fully responsible for and will stand in judgment to give an account before God. My road begins in spiritual death, in full rebellion against God. I was born a sinner. In reflecting back over the past 40 years in the process of writing this, it is certainly clear the steep debt that Christ would pay on my behalf. The act of love that he would become sin on my behalf and take upon himself the wrath of God the Father that I deserved, dying in my place so that I might be imputed with his righteousness. Then for Christ to rise from the dead, securing eternal life, a gift to me as well as to anyone who would repent and trust in Christ. God's redemptive plan before the creation of the world. Putting God's attributes on full display, holiness, sovereignty, justice, grace, mercy, and love, to name a few. Please hear the rest of my story, keeping this context in mind. According to the Bible, understanding God's perspective, I have no doubt of the total depravity that existed in my heart. I am guilty of idolatry, lying, stealing, blasphemy, and adultery. These are only five of the Ten Commandments. I have violated all ten as found in Scripture. Only by God's restraint, through his sovereignty, did I not live out the full potential of the deprivation that existed in me. From when my memories begin, I grew up in a home with moral principles and increasing Christian values. My mom would have been a new Christian and my dad a moral man. My home was a blessing from God even though moralism and Christianity would conflict with each other at times. In spite of this, by the age of six or seven, our whole family would attend church weekly, and that would remain the case for my years at home. As a young teenager, or 11 or 12, I would uh, witness both my parents being baptized. Growing up, I was protected, and I had a loving family. I had even asked Jesus into my heart in my early years. From the world's perspective, I was a pretty good kid. Outwardly, things looked good. Inwardly, that was not the case. Going into my mid-teens, having more opportunity to sin, I would do so, living one version of my life with my friends and another at home and in school. I would be filled with guilt, resulting with me asking Jesus into my heart many times over. Rather than this having a healing effect, it grew skepticism. I would push against things I saw. I would push against things I saw in the church. 
I arrived at the conclusion that the church I knew was full of hypocrisy. Looking back through all those years, I did not know the full truth of the gospel. I had some obscure understanding of it. In 1998, my last year of high school, many homes had been inundated with a new technology, something called dial-up internet. Uh, the popular thing at the time, perhaps the only thing at the time, was to go into chat rooms and talk to people from around the world. Uh, this was quite neat. With hundreds and hundreds of people you could talk to, I recall seeing one person who identified themselves as a Christian. This had my curiosity up as I had not seen that before, so I decided to message her. For a little over a year, we chatted regularly on the computer and had formed a real friendship. During that time, we both trans transitioned from high school into full-time careers. The underlying question in my mind was, going forward, what was life supposed to look like? I negatively concluded that life did not involve talking to a girl from another country who lived thousands of kilometers away. So with no firm convictions or repentance, I pursued a life of increasing sinfulness, a depth to which previously I had not, or a depth to which previously I had been spared. For the next 13 months or so, I completely abandoned that relationship. I hung out with my friends, I lived like the world, I entered into and ended a sinful relationship, resulting in the hurt of another person, and all the while, grieving my parents to whom I did not give much consideration. By God's providence, horrible guilt set in. I had come to the end of myself. I agreed to an invitation from my brother to attend church with him and a friend. I'd like to say that I went through the doors of a theologically rich church, but that was not the case. Looking back to that point, I still didn't know what repent and believe actually meant. Despite not fully understanding this, and would not for several more years, God saved me. He granted me the faith to confess my sins, to turn away from the life I had been living, repentance, and faith to believe in who Christ is and what he did, to want to live according to what he has revealed in his word, belief. I should have been baptized then. That would have been prudent. It wasn't long in the charismatic church before I saw issues. And due to my career as a truck driver, being a part of a church wasn't convenient anyway. These circumstances would provide me room to neglect certain teachings and to go unchallenged in others. However, the majority of the teaching that I did receive came in the form of a daily radio broadcast called Grace to You, led by a pastor named John MacArthur. Now, it had been as many as 15 months with perhaps one correspondence by email to that Christian girl I had met on the internet. I had all but disappeared as far as she knew. This was a friendship that I shattered. With no reasonable expectation that I, that I could even ever contact her again, through God's sovereignty and providence, that relationship was restored. In 2004, Christian and I were married in Texas. God had continued to mold me over the years, conforming me to the likeness of his son by the renewing of my mind and providentially working in our lives. God would bless Chrissy and I with our four children and the means to care for them. Though I still sin and do not always understand or do things right, I believe that God will finish the good work he began in me. I know that he knew me before the foundations of the earth. I know he sustains all things. He will one day return and judge this earth and all who are and have been in it. When Christ returns, I want to be found running the race, being a godly husband and father, unashamed to proclaim Jesus as Lord publicly, to be obedient, 
Today is a step of obedience. To conclude, I would like to read from Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. And so, from that day we heard, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Next.